Um, so now we are recording and if you would like the recording, just send me an email. I'll go ahead and put my email in there if you don't have it already. Um, just shoot me an email and I will get the recording to you. Here's my email, adeter at coloradomtn.edu. So again, we have some people joining us, uh, continuing to join us, but I'll go ahead and get started and just kind of introduce myself. My name is Anne Marie Dieter, and I am the continuing education coordinator here at Colorado Mountain College. We are in Glenwood Springs, Colorado, and uh, which seems weird that I would even have to say that on here, but that's pretty exciting that we can reach so many people that they might not even know. So um, thank you all for coming, and I think it's really exciting. I think our media relations team did a great job getting the word out, so thank you to them for helping us uh, get the word out for this great event. And what we call, this is called the gift of education. And so here at Colorado Mountain College, it was started a while ago and we revamped it at the Glenwood Center and we've been doing some, just some really great talks. Um, and they range from all different topics. So we've done technology, arts, outdoor education, health and wellness. We did one on neuroplasticity, grant writing. So whatever's, helpful to the community and would be great information to get out. That's what we want to do. And so when I ran into a friend of mine, I knew the fires had just stopped and we just thought, you know what, this is great information to get out. And so she connected me, Miss Mia Bolton to uh, Kale, and I'm very appreciative for that. So um, if you guys have any uh, subjects or people that have great knowledge that they would like to share, please send me an email. We'd love to do, a t uh, you know, get some more topics on, on the board and just really share knowledge with the community. Whatever is helpful, whatever is type of education, that's what we're all about. So um, we've got some great information. We, we have uh, Eagle County Television is going to be uh, um, streaming this as well, and then the Post Independent. And so we're just very appreciative. So again, uh, for those that didn't hear, we will be recording this. We are recording this. And so if you would like the recording, just send me an email and I'd love to send it to you. And if you have questions uh, during the presentation, either raise your hand. There's a little emoji down on the bottom. It's called reactions. Just raise your hand and hopefully I'll see it. But there's so many people on here. Um, we'll try to get to it or put it in the chat and we'll go from there. But again, my name is Anne Marie Dieter. I'm the continuing education coordinator at the Glenwood Center in Colorado Mountain College. And I'm going to turn this over. Uh, you, you came here to, to listen to Kale talk. And so I will let him introduce himself. This is Mr. Kale Casey. So thanks so much, Kale. Thank you. <laughs> thanks so much, Anne Marie and everybody. Laura for helping us with the facility and the tech crew working behind the scenes. It's a true honor to be here. I'm actually in Colorado right now, so I'm live from my house in Lake City. I didn't know I'd be down here this winter, uh, but it just happened to be that with the lockdown and working for Anchorage remotely uh, as the lead information officer for the Emergency Operations Center, I could work from here. So I've been able to experience your spring. So I'll do my introduction, but I also want to make sure we, we do some acknowledgements. Um, a lot of you met me this summer uh, doing the fire. It's been my career now for 14 years. It's an unusual career to have found myself in, uh, having been a classicist and historian at Stanford and traveling the world for a while and trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I ended up in fire. And now I've ended up in the world of extreme fire. So, <clears throat> Amory, let's go to that next slide and we'll, we'll do our acknowledgments. And we want to start off with the land we call home, whether it's here in uh, Lake City or my other home in Paoni, where you are in Glenwood. This is uh, land that the Ute Mountain Ute tribe has lived on forever, and uh, we are grateful to them. It's an honor to protect this land and work with this land. I want to thank uh, the president of the Colorado Mountain College, Dr. Hauser, and of course, Anne Marie and Laura, and everybody who's helping. I want to acknowledge our 14 fallen brothers and sisters from South Canyon Fire on July 6, 1994. I know that changed my life. I was in Europe, and I'm sure all you have a story about how it changed your lives, some very deeply, I'd imagine. So. Our love to them. Uh, Garfield and Eagle counties for assisting us during the Grizzly Peak fire and allowing us to have the incredible facilities to do our community meetings that so many of you attended. We're still grateful for that. That was really amazing. CDOT for all the incredible work they did on I-70 before, during and after the fire. 
Uh, the Public Works Department of Glenwood Springs was incredible protecting your watershed. I just want to acknowledge them at the beginning here because I'm still impressed with how uh, caring your water protectors are. White River National Forest and the Bureau of Land Management gave us complete support during the Grizzly Creek, Creek Fire, and we're very appreciative for that. And then the Glenwood Springs Fire Department, we want to thank the Chief and Nina and other folks and remind you to please don't light fireworks. The Chief really wants to make sure nobody's buying those fireworks and lighting them off in your area um, and spread that word to your friend. And then we want to thank all the community groups and volunteer groups like the Roaring Fork Outdoor Volunteers who are actually working on restoration for the Grizzly Creek and that you can help plug into. Also, since we're firefighters, in case my internet connection goes south, I want to say that Mina, Elizabeth, and Ludi, three public information officers are on this call right now and probably some others who can jump right in and take over a little bit. So we always try to have a primary alternate and contingency model for everything that we do. The primary is that my internet in Lake City works great. And the alternate is that uh, my friends from FIRE jump in and help me out here. All right, let's move on. And it is also great to see where everybody's from. I'm a live streamer kind of professionally in Alaska for sled dog races. That's one of the things I do. So I like looking at chats. I like looking where people are from, like uh, Maureen from Glenwood. Thanks for joining us. And so if you put your location in there, I'll take a look at it and see it. Um, this is a, a photo from Aaron Colosi. I just wanted to give the context for firefighting is kind of an addictive lifestyle. Uh, I ended up in the photo on the left during the outside online photo shoot of several years ago that made it in that geo. Um, but it's also taking its toll. And as much as we kind of do the glorification, like our fire bro in the middle uh, with the two saws, um, it is certainly becoming a harder job to sustain in. And even though I will stay in eternally fired up about being in the fire world, it is certainly getting harder every year. Let's go forward. Hold on. No problem. And I, for some reason, I'm not able to see the chat now. So um, okay, I, I've got it. I've got the chat covered here. Okay, we'll switch. <laughs> okay, great. So from 2007 to 2015, I've I worked across the fires in the U.S., but I got my start here in Colorado at the Salida Colorado Fire Camp as an EMT. I was a Uray County volunteer. Lived in Rico for a bunch of years. Katrina hit, and I was hiking the trail around Lake City and thought, you know what, I'm I'm kind of useless right now on the national scale, and I want to be able to help when things like this happen. So that's kind of how I started getting into fire. The photo on the left is actually the San Juan Hot Shots. It's a simulation, and the photo on the right is not a simulation. That was my first seven to eight years of wildfire was doing my EMT then paramedic helicopter crew member and working about 500 to 600 operational periods right on the front lines, right with the guys and gals doing it. We'll go ahead. We hiked, we camped, we trained. This is a low angle uh, rescue simulation by the San Juan. And when you spend that much time out there with the crews, you really start to internalize uh, what they go through, what this challenging lifestyle really is, the aches, the pain, the loneliness, missing weddings, missing birthdays, worrying about things at home, sucking smoke, everything hurts, everything aches. But you really do realize that these folks, year in and year out, are heroes, and, and it does keep us motivated and keep us going. Let's go forward. My wake-up call came in 2012 on the High Park fire. Um, I'm sure that impacted a lot of you. You know, we had 2010, we had the Boulder Four Mile Canyon, and that was a pretty interesting event. Moved really quickly and burned a lot of homes that were pretty vulnerable. And then we got High Park, where the fire was chunking around in the forest. And I, I don't know if anybody remembers this like I do. I was a medic up at Pingree uh, for about 20 days. And it was the first time in my fire career that I saw a column of fire stand up at the end of a day and never go to bed. It just was up all night. It was up in the morning and that's the day it crossed the pooter and burned a whole bunch of houses. And I remember my phone blowing up with text messages from my friends who were losing homes and the emotions of it all. Just, I can, I can actually, I can go back there quite easily because it was the moment I realized we might not get through this. Like fire is getting, the forests are unhealthy. The weather is extreme. We didn't get any help from uh, Mother Nature during that uh, high park. And I actually called the medical unit leader, 
and said, hey, can you ship me out of here? I need to go. And um, day 20, I demobed and I went to Montana and spent the rest of my fire season in Eastern Montana on grass fires where my family and friends weren't losing their homes. And I think that that's something that we all have to remember. Sometimes it's a real honor to fight fire at home. And sometimes it's the hardest darn thing you can possibly do because the emotions, everybody's being impacted, their businesses, their lives, travel corridors and what have you. So 2012, I'm sure woke some of you up too because we also had Waddle Canyon. Go ahead. So there, uh, you, these images are probably looking more familiar to you. Waldo was awful, and, and Sheenan just mentioned there that she lived in Fort Collins during High Park, and they hosted some hot shots in New, Bel New Belgium. Thanks for doing that. Those crews, I know everybody went to the ringer on all these fires, and for a lot of us, it became, okay, this is just going to be our career. We're just going to go from awful event to awful event with hundreds of homes lost, because that's what it felt like for a few years. Go ahead. So then I moved up to Alaska from uh, Colorado in 2015 and 16 to start a dog gear business following my passion for dog sports. And sure as heck, my town burned down in 2015. Eight hours, 54 homes, escaped campfire fireworks from the neighbors up on Sockeye Boulevard. So it became known as the Sockeye Fire. This woman is smiling only because she's resilient and amazing. She's got a magnet. She's looking for her things in her house. This is about a half mile to a mile from my house which is now in the black. So everything that I own in Alaska has been nuked by fire in 2015, and I've built my business and home in that black. So it's a, it's a pretty powerful way to relate to communities when you can say that you've been through it. Go ahead. So then here we are two years ago, and guess what? My town burned down again. We lost another 54 homes in eight hours. That's the wind event right there. It was called the McKinley fire and sure as heck, the wicked wind event knocks power lines, burns all through the night. People almost died. Firefighters were heroic, but we still lost a lot in our neighborhood. And it really, really, really impacted. The nice thing is four years later, I became a type one information officer for the Alaska team was able to run the entire show. In 2015, I was just a trainee in information. And so I got to do what I love to do, which is connect with communities. Go ahead. It's clear from the work that we are doing with McKinley Fire that we have PTSD within our community. Everybody who lived in the black of the, the 2015 fire was convinced it was going to come right through and take them all out again. For those of you who have been evacuated, for those of you who have been around events that have taken out structures or really put pressure on you, um, you'll know that this PTSD creeps up every time we start getting these wind events. It's been really windy in Lake City the last few days. And it gets under my nerves a little bit because it makes me think about the drying effect and all the all the things that are coming right. Um, so, in our community, we really developed a, a program in 2019 to communicate in a heartfelt, honest way early and often and try to help people sleep at night. That's the, the goal that we came up with as information officers is in this new era of extreme fire. We have to do everything we can, whatever it takes to give people assurance that we're here that it's 24 seven that we're gonna stay on top of it, that even though it seems overwhelming to stop fires, we're gonna be there and we're gonna give updates and we're gonna help you sleep at night. Go ahead. So in 2020 last year, you and everybody else was in awe. I can only imagine those in the front range who got to see those images of the Cameron Peak fire. This was a couple days before the, uh, the Pacific Northwest team, my other team got called in to be the sixth team on that fire. I spent 35 operational periods on the Cameron Peak fire. And here we are. 2012 was one thing. 2020, bigger, nastier, drier, fire moving all over the place, coming over the divide, jumping into Estes National. I mean, like just you live through it. We live through it. Um, and we'll go ahead and we'll go see Northern California next. So we worked the Million Acre Fire in California, the Alaska team. Uh, there is nothing like seeing the image on the right that my PIO and smoke jumper friend Mike McMillan took on September 26th. I was on one side of the fire watching it blow up and taking pictures. There's the blow up on the left. Mike was over in Ruth as fire ripped through the community, burned all sorts of houses. Civilians weren't leaving. They were staying in place. Firefighters had to stand down for safety. And even Mike, the photographer, took off his PIO hat 
and became a structure protection specialist and started working as a basically a task force leader protecting homes that very afternoon. That was a horrible event in Northern California and all the fuels were like they were in Colorado. They were dry and endlessly available and endlessly resistant. And we got to a million acres of several different fires merging all over the place. And when you're on a fire line with a perimeter that big, hundreds of miles, it definitely worries you as to what the future might look like for us. Okay, so here we are with, with the fire that impacted Glenwood Springs this summer. Uh, I wanna thank Emily for that photo. Um, I think everybody learned that fire is very creative and, and hungry at finding a way. It's gonna find a way up a slope it's gonna find a way up what looks like rocky and desert. It's gonna find a way to hunker down and wait something out and then move. And we got to 32,000 acres of this fire trying to figure out how to get out of this canyon and move in, in all the other directions. So our AK team came in and we have our values that I wanted just to give a quick snapshot of the folks who served you. Duty, respect and integrity are everything for us. We'll go through this one pretty quick, Cameron. We have a style. Oh, we'll go back one. Oh, sorry. No problem. We have a style that I told you about. It's from the 2015 and 2019 fires in my hometown that we want to build trust. We want to leave lasting relationships like the ones we have here tonight within impacted communities through honest, frequent, and heartfelt communications interactions. On the left picture there, that's our yurt where we worked out of in the Eagle County Fairgrounds. And Tim Mowry was the guy in the middle who wrote your 6 a.m. post every morning with all the assets on the fire and the photo of the day. And that was so cool how you guys, you know, hundreds of you liked and shared that. And, and it meant a lot to us to know you were engaged <clears throat> right to the end of the fire. Okay. We also embrace the high-tech, low-tech and, and fire teams are doing this more and more with the uh, live streaming, the field reports, we call them with that little handheld gimbal on the right that Alan's holding. And then we have our friends in Glenwood um, going around putting up the low tech signs. We didn't know if we we're gonna do that this year because of COVID, um, but I'm sure a lot of you saw the, those all of the community. And so we, we're gonna continue to embrace that um, high tech and low tech. We went out of our way to make sure we got up to the top of the fire line to let you know where things that were really important to you were happening. I don't know if you remember Spud, SpongeBob, the skidgen operator, but he was the one working on the north side, uh, putting fire line in, putting in, and then hundreds of you shared it and, and you know commented, and we really appreciated the fact that this community of Glenwood Springs and the greater fire community is becoming more engaged about the, the pieces of equipment we use, our tactics, how we operate. And when the firefighters see the engagement, it actually gives them a lift too, because sometimes they feel forgotten up there on the fire line. Okay, there's Hickenlooper on the right. This is the, just a little snapshot inside of our Eagle, our Eagle uh, County Fairgrounds. And so uh, part of this rhythm that we, uh, we didn't know how many VIPs we were gonna get, but we knew everybody was gonna come to Glenwood and Eagle because of your situation with the watershed in Glenwood, the impact to the I-70, and the, of course, the, the most visited forest in the United States is your forest and one of the prettiest places that's ever been on earth. And I fell more in love with Colorado working on the, the ridges above Glenwood Springs. Okay, I think that covers our crew there, Emery. And then <clears throat> we'll get into the part where I want to engage, you got, go ahead, but go forward one, um, where I want to start engaging with you. And, and this is the community preparedness. My neighbor in 2015, his name's Peter Duncan. This is his million dollar home. Uh, the one next to it is a garage that didn't burn. And that's where the Iditarod champion from three years ago actually lived and trained. But this home, his home, his dream home from Scotland burned to the ground. And you can see behind there, it was a sea of black spruce around his property. Complete sea. And his quote, like a lot of folks probably who are still trying to pull this excuse, I didn't know it burned like this in Alaska. I didn't know it burned like this in Colorado. I didn't know it burned like this in the mountains. I didn't know it burned like this in the spring. I didn't know it burned like this in, in the winter. I didn't know it, that we, community preparedness means we can't have any more excuses. 
about I didn't know. If we were alive in 2020 watching the news in the United States and breathing the air, we know everything can burn everywhere. Wisconsin right now is having a record fire season. They've had more fires to this date right now in Wisconsin than they had all last year. And if you've ever fought a grass or a running farm fire, they get nasty, they get dangerous, they can kill cattle quickly, they can kill you quickly. And one of our big watchouts, common denominators on fatality fires is on a quieter part of a fire where activity suddenly happens. And that's kind of what Wisconsin's gonna start facing. We can't have any more excuses. I didn't know it burn April 15th when the lightning or the power line got hit by the wind here and the grasses were dry. I thought we just came out of winter. Nope, it can burn right now. It already is burning. We are, Mina can actually put in the chat from the Glenwood Fire Department. We've already had calls in your area. So I kind of am a little bit obsessed with Firewise because I built my house. You can see it there behind those three trees that I left. I used to have 50 trees, just like those three trees in the right picture. And in the last month, I finally came to the conclusion that my house has no chance at survival without me taking decisive action and making a stand replacing event happen at my property here above Lake City. You can see Lake San Cristobal is that frozen thing off to the right. We're 10,000 feet facing south. I've got all sorts of fuel issues with beetle kill and different successions where the old trees are dying, what have you, but I finally just decided, you know what? It's not okay anymore to look around here and say, well, I hope we get through this summer and I'll work on it next year. <clears throat> so day and night before and after work, I'm out there with my saw, I'm limbing, I'm cutting, I'm doing all sorts of work and I'm doing a lot of it right now because I still have some snow on the ground. And that's gonna change really quickly. It's already drying out up here. Uh, I'm already worried about my fuels. And so I can't keep burning like this unless I'm on snow because we're already in the watch out situation. So for you at home, for you in Glenwood, for you in Eagle, and I'll look and see where other folks are from. Um, let's see, we have our Florida, Ludi burns in the spring. I know that, um, Gainesville, they, you know, I was on the Alligator Alley fire in 2009, Florida burns, pretty much Meeker burns, obviously dry as heck up there, grass interface. So LM Lockwood up there and Meeker, you can attest to that. Um, we have to get after this year round and you have to do it wisely. In the summer, you have to take different actions than in the winter when you can burn things or you can get rid of your fuels easier. Okay, let's go ahead and move forward. And so basically in my rule of thumb here, uh, and this is almost my last slide, so we're gonna open this up to a lot of discussion, but you need to make it obvious that you have defensible space. And three weeks ago, when you looked out at this picture, there were 50 trees right there that was obvious I did not have defensible space. And it's been 15 years since I bought this property and I've been thinning and working and chipping away at it forever because we had the aspen blight, we had this, we had that. But I finally decided that I was gonna do something for the fire crews that might have to be here in Lake City and for the helicopter that might have to land up here to protect my house. So I created a landing zone. I created a safety zone. I created an area that a crew could camp in, could work in, could set all their tents up in, could operate out of. And that's what firefighters want to see when they go to your property. They wanna see that you have done something to create them defensible space. They wanna see that you've taken that favorite 10 trees that you've loved and you've told stories about and your kids were raised under in the shade and rope swings and you cut them down to create defensible space. They wanna see that they can pull their rigs in, that they can get operational in there, get a tender or an engine or whatever, port of tanks and pumps, whatever they need and operate. And when residents do that for firefighters, especially these days, because we're becoming more risk wise and fire wise ourselves, we're not, we don't wanna die anymore. We don't wanna take that risk. So a lot of fire crews are gonna actually visually inspect your business property, wherever, whatever it is that you have, and they're gonna triage, they're gonna, they're gonna prioritize. They're gonna do the things that they can do safely first. And that might mean saving your neighbor's house that has a bigger access, better turnaround, more trees thinned out than yours. 
which maybe you didn't quite get around to, or maybe you like the look of a tighter interface. And that's the kind of critical decision thinking that we have to do as fire, firefighters and that we're actually mentored and instructed to do. In California, they just straight up make it, they put a sign uh, on your driveway that says yes or no, but there's degrees of it. And if you haven't done the work to fireways your property, it just says something like no, and the engine crew doesn't even bother. They just go right on to the next house because they've had so many issues. They have so many traps and hazards and they've had to come up with solutions that protect the values at risk. Yes, but also protect the firefighters who have died in those driveways when fire came over them. Okay. I think we're right there at the end there. Anyway. Okay. Let's, before we go into the volunteer part, let's get into some questions and answers here. Okay, so uh, Ludi also from Florida just said, we're in the middle of our spring wildfire season right now. The majority of Florida Peninsula is two to six inches below our average rainfall for this time of year. And if you don't think Florida can burn, pull up some video. That place can get intense and it can move through there and it will scare the heck out of you. And there, yes, there are big pythons all over the place. You have to also GPS and let folks know about. So ET said, uh, we've had a couple of fires in Northwest Wyoming. Exposed grass and sage is still dormant and dried out, waiting for green up. Very available, surrounded by snow. So that translation for non-fuels and fire people is that this time of year, you have this strange uh, drying effect, even though it's spring. And so we have the same thing in Alaska too, where we have this really vulnerable, like three weeks in May and June, where we can have structures lost in a matter of hours because of grass fire, but there's snow all throughout the area still, or there's water in different, uh, different parts of the landscape, but it can move, it can move quickly. And I know fire has moved on top of the snow on Pikes Peak above the bushes before. So um, pretty intense. I'm closest to Grand County and can't seem to reach anyone about volunteering. Okay, about Grand Lake. Does any, okay, so maybe people who are observing the chat can neighbors helping neighbors here. We have a person who wants to volunteer in the Grand Lake area. Um, and maybe, we, maybe Jacob can put them in touch with a volunteer organization out there. Does anybody want to unmute and ask a question or raise a hand or? Unshare this so I can see who's. Yep. Let's unshare that for a minute. We'll go back to the volunteer. That's the recovery part. Paul Chapman had his arm and his hand up at the city. Paul Chapman, if you still have a question, I should have uh, sent you a uh, button to unmute. Uh, no, no question. It was just we observed that we did not have any audio coming through. So, this, so that was that we uh, did the, the dial up uh, number in case anybody oh. else is watching. Uh, oh, gotcha, but okay, but we're good to go. Keep rolling. Yeah, I'll go through and see if there's any other. Okay, good. And uh, look at that. Tracy LeClaire helping out Grand County contact Grand Fire. So Shelly Olson or Grand Lake Fire. <clears throat> Okay, and then Ann asked about, so FireWise is a national program, Ann, and there's community FireWise too. So on the Cameron Peak Fire last year, there was a community that had just done their community FireWise and it really helped them out. So there's the individual responsibility, defensible space around your structure to protect your pets, your family, your visitors. I mean, there's, you actually should feel like you have a personal responsibility to protect the people who might be at your house during fire season. I certainly do. This is a, 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 a beautiful hard earned structure that I spent a ton of time on fire earning. I don't want to lose it to fire. I want it to be here and I want my family to come here and I want my friends to come here and I want you all to come here. And I want it to be here. So I feel more obligation personally. I'm not in a community. I'm alone on the mountain and in an in holding. So I have to do even more, but in a community, there can be discussions looking at funding, and of course, you have to keep at it. Firewise communities get a nice placard, but if they leave that placard and don't do anything for two years, they're already regrowing back their flashy fuels and light fuels. So there's a whole system about clearing zones, gravel instead of wood chips. I mean, a lot of houses in Four Mile Canyon, 
I got to tell you, as a medic, I got to hang out up in there. It was awful to see people losing their homes because the fire was backing down the hillside to their yard that was covered in pine cones, to their wood deck that was covered in pine cones, to their hippie house or whatever cool house they had up there in the canyon that got annihilated several days after the flame front came through because there was so much creeping fire still and the span of control was still a problem. Um, you go up Four Mile Canyon now and you see those houses that are rebuilt. They have gravel all around them. They have metal decks, they have concrete siding and their insurance agents are very pleased with the change. They look tough, they look resilient and you're starting to hear the word harden more. Firewise is essentially hardening, taking the steps to harden your house, either through sprinkler systems or, or setting up another well pump or whatever it is that you're gonna do. Certainly removing the fuels, certainly having a plan for evacuation for your pets, for your horses, for your, your medications and all those type of things. And I mentioned to you that my community in Alaska has PTSD. When that McKinley fire a couple of years ago was eight miles north of the last burn scar, all the mushers in the burn scar, because we had a thousand dogs evacuated in 2015 and only a couple died. These are the Iditarod sled dogs that you hear so much about. All of those mushers had their trucks ready, all the doors open. They have, all have evacuation plans in their kennel operations now. They have primary contact, secondary contact, locations of dogs, locations of dog medications, all that type of preparation is part of our culture now because we've been there. So in your neck of the woods, and Anne, I'm not exactly sure where you live, try to get these conversations going. We certainly have conversations going in the Matsu borough where I live. And I just wanna acknowledge that Casey Cook, the emergency manager in Alaska for Matsu borough is on this call right now. Casey, thank you for, for uh, protecting us and keeping us firewise in Alaska. Okay, so let's go to Jean. Okay. And, and if somebody has a question, member, raise your hand or get Anne-Marie's attention and I'll keep looking at the chat. How do you motivate neighbors who do not take fire mitigation seriously and won't defend their home with impacts the whole neighborhood? Jean Johns Johnson, that is a fabulous question on the human dilemma. What do you do? Um, and, and I'd open this up to, to people who have already been through this experience, and I heard this a lot uh, where I live. Um, the spring after we lost the second set of homes, everybody wanted to get busy. And then that's the common question. Well, if I, if I take care of my half acre here, but I border five acres, well, what about the five acres? And, and so there's a couple of different scenarios. One, there can be um, state or county land near you, and you can kind of contact some local officials and, and start being the squeaky wheel that says, I'm not comfortable with this fuel load. What's the hazardous fuel plan for this area? And if, if, if those topics aren't at the top of people's minds, make them at the top, right? There's a, a famous line from our movie about the terrible tragedy in Yarnell where we lost our hotshot crew. Uh, Granite Mountain Hotshots, we lost 19. Um, you'll remember if you watch the movie, there's a point when the crew superintendent says, if you're in this business long enough, everything becomes fuel to your eyes. Everywhere you look is fuel. And that's kind of how us seasoned people now are traveling around our states. <clears throat> A million acres last year in California, several big fires in Colorado. What, what do you think I felt when I drove from the Front Range through Glenwood, over to Paonia, through Somerset, and I saw hazardous fuel build up all over this landscape I've known for 20 plus years. And it just becomes clear and clear to my eyes that I can see the landscape and I can see it burnt. I can see the landscape, I can feel the wind event, the wind event that drives these fires. It's almost always an epic event that drives these fires. Once you start seeing your landscape and seeing the wind event, and going back to your fire history, you realize that it's a return interval. The fires are gonna come. They're meant to be there. We're just not meant to have so much fuel and so many things in the way. So what do you do about the neighbor who's not playing ball? Now you gotta be strategic and broaden out that community discussion and, and do, do everything you can to inspire, um, inspire that conversation. Let's see, uh, Greg Young. This is great. 
What is your experience about residents evacuating um, and impacts the first responders facing that issue here in Glenwood being in canyons with limited roadways? Okay, Greg, uh, you nailed it on the head, man. This is becoming a bigger problem for the first responders as people exercising their right to not leave. And though I will personally never question your decision to stay and defend your home properly, um, it does inherently put responders' lives at risk, and it certainly puts a lot of mental strain on the whole incident management team and emergency response organization, because everybody is worried about you. And there's certain things we can and can't do when civilians are in the arena or in the battlegrounds. Uh, we have to then change our focus to human safety instead of uh, houses. And so in Ruth, California this past summer, there is gonna be a long-term battle between the neighbors about who caused whose house to burn down because we lost homes absolutely in front of our own eyes in real time because people wouldn't leave. Like I'm not talking a few homes, I'm talking a lot of homes. The kind that really sticks in your mind like, wow, I get it that people wanna defend themselves and it gets murky when it's the, the heat of battle about is the firefight going well? Is it not going well? Are there fire crews actually gonna to come to my house? Is this whole thing just a mess? Because it's really messy when you have sparks and embers and huge columns falling and collapsing over a, a landscape and fire everywhere. Uh, it, it's leaving communities torn with how to protect their own homes because there can be the perception that fire crews didn't do what they're supposed to do, do the job that they all pulled back to the community center. And that's where I saw them when my neighbor's house burned. Well, they had an accountability order to get into a place where everybody could be accounted for during the firestorm. So then we could re-engage. But to the public that looks like, oh, they let my house burn. Or, oh, those damn federal firefighters aren't as good as the, as the Cal Fire ones. Or and when you're in this business long enough, you hear it all. Um, and I'm more and more concerned about it because I do want people to, to do the right thing for themselves, uh, but also to understand that um, when you're in our world and we have a delegation of authority to be there, we worry about you. We worry about you a lot and it, and it can change how we operate. Hey, Carol, um, Adrian Fielder had a question. Let me, let me um, unmute him. Yeah, what is the, what is the, the, the cost? That should just be easy to Google. Um, I stopped caring what fires cost because it adds up so much. And it's, it's not that I stopped caring, but I was on the Soberanas $250 million fire twice in 2016 in California, most expensive fire in history. Firefighting costs to date, I think in the last 40 years, are about $106 billion. Um, they are costing more and more every year. I think that's pretty obvious as we get into more aviation. Uh, we can blow a million dollars pretty quickly in just initial attack. So, for example, if the fire's running up out of the canyon in homes and we call in that air show and we have load and return um, big air tankers flying back and forth, the retardant base and helicopters, we can spend a million dollars in a day easily on aviation. And then all that can get burned up the next day. And then we have two more months to go to, to put the fire out, depending on the weather conditions. Not, not that we want it to take that long, but as you can tell from your own lived experience, when it's dry, you have what's called resistance to control. And Colorado last summer, look at us. We were, I was up in Pingree filming a crew in the snow who was doing hot spots and cutting fire line November 21st, 22nd, because we were worried that we were gonna have another Fern Lake Estes National Park fire like we had in December of 2010 when the thing blew out because the snow that came in had no moisture. How crazy is that? We were literally putting out hot spots in the snow and it was 35 degrees. And I can put the video link in the, uh, in the chat so you can see it. The, the crew was awesome. They were from uh, the Northwest. So we'll, we'll somebody can Google the cost and so, there we go. Thank you, Tracy, 34 million. Appreciate that. That's, that's exactly what I like. Okay, Anne-Marie, any other? Um... Uh, 
Um, I'm looking in here too, so. Yeah, I don't see. Okay, so Ann, you're from Bond, Colorado. Yes. Yeah, work with them on that. And if you haven't had a close, nothing like a close call to bring people together, but then nothing like time for people to forget, right? Okay, so Tom Lacey said in June, my son and I flew a drone over much of the area that burned with that footage and or flight over the same area be of use to anyone. And Tom, obviously you, you, you didn't fly when we were there because we don't allow that, which is just another important really part for the public <clears throat> with the aviation aspects. We, we have our drone issues. Um, I was on the first fire in Arizona where they actually prosecuted criminally a drone operator. He put the drone footage from the fire around Prescott uh, and Prescott's where the Yarnell crew is from, by the way, um, on his page. And then the sheriff just made the pretty easy connection and arrested him. Um, but if anybody wants that footage, let them know. And then we have Gene again with that question. Okay, let's open it up some more. I, I'm, I'm curious as to what, okay, Michael Offit, do you see landscaping companies taking fire mitigation into consideration as they landscape new properties in the mountain region? Michael, gosh darn, I wish uh, that there were more codes, kind of like what happened in Four Mile Canyon um, for, for anybody building a new home. Uh, I've been to people's properties, friends of mine that have just spent a million dollars on a house and I look in their backyard and there's a decadent old oak forest or some decadent tree system. And I'm like, how did your builder even approve leaving these things here so close to your brand new home? And where's your pump and where's your diesel generator? And so Michael, I think it's your best choosing a landscaping company that has firewise values and mitigation values in their company uh, literature. And then the rest of us just need to put pressure on everybody to wake up and start taking care of business and, and being more prepared. And do I see these companies offering low impact, get beautiful landscaping options to homeowners? Yes. I actually think that a properly firewised home not only looks really, really good, but there is a peace and a feeling that comes when you can look at something and you know, all right, a crew can work here, an engine can work here, good. There is, because the opposite is what we're all dealing with, the angst, the wonder, the worry. Is it gonna blow our direction? What's gonna happen when it does? And then there's the, then there's the remorse that happens when one neighbor's house burns and the other doesn't, because that's inevitable. Whether it's in Waldo or Four Mile High Park or wherever you've been, Cameron, anywhere, there's going to be a house that burns and a house that doesn't burn, and people have to live with those memories. Elizabeth Velasco, who worked with us as a Spanish translator on the Grizzly Creek, asked a question: Could you talk about working with diverse communities and the ways that you offer information to make it reach rural areas, non-English speakers, travel communities, hard of hearing folks, etc.? You bet, Elizabeth. And and her crew was a part of that last year. So as you might recall we had a simulcast of the community meetings during Grizzly Creek. And so while we were presenting, whether it was the incident commander or the mayor or whoever it was, Elizabeth and her crew were simulcasting in Spanish for the entire population around our area. We do have FIBOI compliance federal rules for subtitles You're, you saw during the pandemic, much more use of ASL in the um, Emergency Operations Center updates around the nation. Um, we call it a high tech, low tech balance, where we're looking to get more translations done for the uh, language groups in the areas that we work in. So, for example, if you're in the Northwest, you might have certain Russian speaking communities and certain Hmong speaking communities and um, Latino communities. So you might be actually um, translating into three or four languages. Uh, Governor Jay Inslee in Washington during the pandemic mandated that um, that they recognize that there's 40 plus languages that Washingtonians um, speak and that uh, the Emergency Operations Center information officers had to translate more like a dozen or so every time and then uh, to the maximum limit only in certain situations. So we're all becoming more aware that it's not just that we need to get information out in the traditional way we've always done. In the tribes, we have to do a lot more one-on-one uh, -on -one communication 
and working with the tribal council so that they, because they're sovereign nations and, uh, and we respect that. We also work with a lot of incredible native uh, Alaskan and native American uh, firefighting crews who are, who hopefully and, and often do take that knowledge back to the village and help their own villages become uh, firewise. So getting the information out equitably um, and thankfully the pandemic really helped us all up that game. So hopefully this summer when we're out and about, um, we'll be even better at, at reaching everybody. Okay, Adrian Fielder, what is the connection between climate change and fuel moisture content? That is such a great question. It's, it's what I'm worried about right now. We had super low live fuel moistures in Colorado last year, which is why we were digging fire line in the snow up in Pingree in November. Then you have a chance to recover through snow melt, which is happening right now, where it penetrates into those bigger trees. Trees often, especially the lodge pull up there in our area around here, the pinyon juniper <clears throat> and the grasses they are gonna carry a certain amount of live fuel moistures. And those are just one of the metrics we use to track the droughts. If we don't get good spring rains and monsoon here soon, and if we get right into the warm, hot days that Colorado is known for, um, we will see a explosive fire year. We'll probably see an explosive fire anyway, because there's no way that the recovery is likely uh, in the next few months. Um, and then we're right into the heat of the summer again, and we'll have tourists and people will make mistakes and we'll have fires. So as things get warmer, earlier, and for longer with higher winds and more intense heat, your live fuel moistures drop, your energy release components increase, and you get into this perfect storm where it doesn't take much of anything for explosive fire spread. And that's exactly what we saw all throughout the summer last year. Uh, Anonymous asked, how do folks like you with your experiences rest when it's over? Especially if you see the fire fuel everywhere. That's a really good question. Mental health is something that is um, a challenge for us. And I'll admit it. Um, I'm a little OCD. I'm super passionate about what I do. I want to be better at it all the time. And now I've got this problem of realizing that I had to make a big defensible space. And so it, it becomes consuming. Uh, my off season this year was none. I got home from Cameron Peak Thanksgiving and started working for Anchorage January 11th. Um, although I was trying to hide down here and just relax. Um, so we're getting less rest. Um, we're recognizing that hotshot crews, smoke jumpers, there's high alcoholism. Uh, divorce and suicide rate. In fact, a whole group of hotshots and soups just sent um, Congress a four page uh, proposal for increased pay, increased uh, support, increased recognition. Um, and having spent those first 500 days out with those crews of my career, uh, I can assure you it is, there is nothing lonelier than holding a fire line for 14 days and being out there when your kid's having a birthday or when the cool stuff's happening all over the country and you're not there again and you're mission driven and you're financially driven, but that toll is adding up and uh, hopefully folks are joining the ranks because that's what we need to like Elizabeth got her public information officer merit badge equivalent this year. So she'll be able to be dispatched to go out on fires more, which is great. We need crews coming in that are rested and feel good because our we've been asking more and more of our crews. So um, really good question there. I think Amherst. Frosty had a question. Let's see. Okay, if cool. Unmute if you want to. Kale, thanks so much. Uh, uh, Frosty Marriott in Carbondale. I write a monthly column for the Post Independent and, and my theme on my next column is there's no such thing as a hundred year fire uh, flood or storm anymore and and what point would you want me to get out there on the fire part of that if i could get one point out to the public readership of the post independent it's not if it's when absolutely and we have i mean in fact i'm going to ask you all too. throw throw for frosty throw a comment 
in the chat as to what you think the one big take home is for people. For, for me, I can already see their house burning down in my mind. So I, I look around and say, okay, nobody here has done enough work. So now we're gonna have to do extra work and we're gonna lose things. That's pretty much every town we go to uh, in the United States. There's a few that have gotten together and, and done well, but most everybody else is kind of, kind of still sitting ducks. So, um, you know, we're calling it more of a fire year now, Frosty. Um, I remember driving home from Academy and Front Range, I think 2009, and there was a fire in Boulder and was like, like literally December in the evening. Uh, you could see it from the highway and you're like, it's December. Um, so uh, let, me, let me think more on that, but basically it's not if, it's when, and have your P's, your, your papers, your pills, your pets, your evacuation plan, you know, understand your county's ready, set, go, understand where you're gonna go, and, um, and, and, you know, on a side note, Frosty, as I started to think about my own um, desire to have a family someday and everything, which thankfully comes and goes, and right now it's, it's on the wane. Um, but when it comes, I think about, I would have my family be mobile, personally, because the, my least favorite thing in life is sitting in an area that's smoky for weeks when I don't have to. I have to do it professionally all the time. So when I don't, ha when I don't have to do it, I think about, the big picture of, okay, we're gonna have awful air quality on any year where we're dry. And this year, the West is set up to nuke. 60% of the states have drought codes. We have 40 to 60% of our snowpack. California has record dry fuels. Colorado won't recover. So then you have to start thinking, okay, do I wanna not have a plan or do I wanna have a plan? And in my plan, it would be make sure my home is defended, make sure I have my evacuation figured out, who I'm gonna stay with, what I'm gonna do. And then I actually have a second plan. What if my region gets choked for weeks and weeks and weeks like it did? Then what do I do? If I have the means, I would relocate my family to another part of the country for a while to just recognize that that's the new normal. Like here we have all these people sitting in the Bay Area choking for weeks and weeks. I don't see that going away next year for them and more folks deciding, okay, I'm gonna go to North Carolina for three weeks if I can swing it. Of course, there's some privilege there, I get that, but we're, we're in like the two phases of the new normal. Fire could get you and your lungs could certainly take the price. And that air quality, wasn't that awful last year? I mean, Absolutely. it's just, that's the new, and it, and it can blow in from Canada. It can blow in from Alaska. It blows in regionally from Arizona. So. It's, and, and we get the same thing in Alaska. The, the year we burned 5 million acres in 2019 when we lost our second group of homes, it was 90 degrees for weeks. And we had 5 million acres burning, imagine. Thanks for that question, Frosty. Oh, look, and ET left a nice comment in there. Thanks for doing that. I see another one, which I think is a great question. Uh, what's the most impactful and what are the best ways to show communities thanks and gratitude to the fire crews and support staff? Okay, well, no question about it. Signage, stamped postcards, donations to the Wildland Firefighter Fund because they take care of anybody who's hurt instantly. So if a firefighter's hurt, the nonprofit organization immediately contacts their family and starts making support happen. The postcards that are stamped allow firefighters who really don't have a life when they're on fire, right? If you're on a 20 person crew, you gotta be up at 05, you gotta be a briefing at 06, you gotta have this done by 07, you gotta be in the truck by 08. You're not, you don't have like the, oh, I'm gonna go take 20 minutes and go send my wife a, a birthday card kind of option when you're a firefighter on a crew. So when they can grab a stamp postcard that you've donated from the command post, quickly write a, I love you, or hey, good luck with first day of school, or something like that, it not only helps them, but imagine back home, right? So it's not just their family seeing social media of them working, sucking smoke and being in harm's way. There's an actual connection there. What we have had in the past is a problem with donations becoming a logistical nightmare for us. And it's the right intent that people wanna donate and give and support firefighters. But I've been on incidents where entire school buses came up from John Day, Oregon, to our, they tried to come to our command post in Kettle Falls, Washington, 
we got smart about the plan and we made them pull into the local fire department and unload all their rock star caffeinated drinks, all this stuff that we don't want anywhere near us. We don't want any of that stuff near us. We've got our own everything, but we, we diverted because you can get into a situation where the generous generosity of a community can create work and headaches for the fire team, the logistics crew, the drivers they have to stack stuff, they have to deal with it. Um, so keep it simple, make banners, postcards and donate. Good question though. Oh, that's so, so nice. Who do we send a stamp postcard to? That's really nice. So next time there's a fire that you're picking up on near you um, and you wanna help out the fire crews that are on that fire, you go ahead and just contact the information unit and say, hey, I wanna send your firefighters some stamp postcards. Where should I do that? That's really nice though. So Michael Offit said, my takeaway is defensible space is a much bigger issue than I thought. And here's why, Michael. Fire likes 50 mile an hour days. Loves it. Flame lengths all day long. 50 mile an hour wind in Colorado. Oh man, South Canyon. Uh, for those of you who've hiked it and been up there and, and, and paid respects to the 14 fallen, those were 100 plus foot flame lengths from that PJ. 100 plus foot flame lengths with wind moving at your structure. You need space, not a couple trees. You need space. You need to create a humidity bubble. So when our jumpers jump in Alaska and uh, the north part of the state, they're usually protecting individual cabins out in the bush. And we have a state responsibility to do that both for private landowners and for the native Alaskans who got their land through the Native Settlement Act. And, and it's really important that those are preserved. So the jumpers jump. And the first thing that they try to do is get a pump into some sort of water and get sprinklers going because their number one tool that they have time for is a humidity bubble. When a flame front comes around a wet structure, it doesn't burn the structure. It might burn all the trees. It might later dry out the structure and get it if there's not enough people eventually to get in there and, and, and get the structure secured, but a wet structure doesn't burn. And so that's what our jumpers and hotshots who are on the front lines of all of us are doing. They're jumping in, they're getting their pair of cargo, they're setting up pumps, four sprinklers, one on the roof, boom, go to the next house. And they've got it all prepped. And if the fire's coming right there, they pull the pump and walk away and let it just spray water. And they save an enormous amount of cabins and structures that way because the humidity bubble and they got a little bit of space to work in. And of course they will use their saws and cut trees too. So Kristen Barrett, what do you think of Joe's bill to create a government funded civilian conservation corps to do fire mitigation? Yeah, we are so far behind. <laughs> we are so far behind mechanical fuel reduction. It's, it's incredible. Uh, Governor Newsom in California just got the first 563 million going yesterday of a billion dollar bill. So California is gonna start dumping money into fuel reduction right now. Uh, I think their legislature like literally opened the coffers this morning. Um, uh, he made the mistake of saying in his press conference, we're going to get ready for fire season. No, it's going to take you years to catch up. As we all know, there's just too much. Um, there's a great meme at California that says this state can fit a, and then you fill in the blank swear word, ton of fires, right? From last year. So, um, the work is going to be many, many years, but anybody, um, who's putting a bill forward to get crews out there uh, working now just for situational awareness in the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, Washington, that's where most of our contract fire crews come from. There were many on the Grizzly. Um, and at the end of the year, we had a, basically our only crews in Cameron Peak were from the Northwest. And these are private sector crews because they get a lot of contracts to work on the forest lands because of course the timber industry in Oregon, Washington. And that's really helped the fire service because now we have these really tough, smart, strong crews that work nationally and move around. So there's a lot of different ways we can we can try to mitigate, but we need we need money for sure. And then Adrian said, who should we get contact to get an estimate on the cost of mitigating a property? I would love as somebody in the Glenwood area who has worked with either a landscaping company, a mitigation company, um, uh, to go ahead and throw something in the chat for Adrian. 
to get a local uh, estimate. And then the other conversation we'd have at the local fire department, Adrian, and, and get recommendations from um, people at the station about the FireWise program, defensible space, prevention, and who they recommend uh, and who they've worked with or who, who they know has done good work. These are really good questions. Oh, you bet. She said the thanks in there. And, you know, I, I am the kind of person who can talk all night and I can start ad-libbing, but I, I do actually really want to hear from, from you or from anybody. Um, you know, if you've been evacuated before, you know that this is the time slows down uh, when the crisis is happening. And it really is good to have a pre-designated family member to go to as opposed to a shelter. Um, it's really good to just um, kind of prepare your mind to say, Okay, that's my new reality. I'm going to shift into this new reality, whether the reality is protecting your lungs and getting fresh air uh, by relocating or whether your new reality is that um, you don't know when you're going to go back home and that's okay because we need the fire crews to do what they need to do. And, and that patience is something that when we see as fire crews, it is so uplifting when the public stays supportive of the mission, stays engaged, engaged with the social media, with the community meetings and says, yes, we get this. This is a hard fight. We're not going to sit here and armchair quarterback you, uh, but we're going to encourage you to do it safely and, and do it thoroughly. Um, that's, that's a really valuable gift that you personally can give. Um, I had a, a, a burn out here yesterday that got so much smoke going that I, it brought me right back to the fire line where I was choking and I couldn't see and I had ash blown in my face and I went right back to all those crews out there who are just going to be doing that all summer long. And I just feel for their parents. Like, how did parents let us do this? You know, my mom didn't want me to necessarily go camp on fire lines with big trees falling and, and, and shaking the ground at night when you're out there uh, on the top of a ridge, like we were in Kings Canyon National Park when the sugar pines fall after they've burned for so long. They're, so, they're like redwoods. They're so big, they shake the ground you're sleeping on. And you're, you know, these are magical moments, but they're also like, what are we doing out here? We're crazy. This, this job is insane. So maybe, this, Kale, maybe this is already out there, but is there like a link or something for like a packing list? So if people are getting their plan together, I mean, I'm sure it's out there on the internet maybe, but maybe you know of a good one for families that are trying to plan of the peas. Like I'd never yep. heard that before. So stuff like that. Okay. Yep, the peas are great. And, and and they're easy to stick in your head because you can think of a few P things, right? Your your meds are pills, your pets, course, papers. Um, and yes, they're, the, and in fact, if anybody from, if Ludi or one of my coworkers could, could, uh, so I don't have to start Google searching right now while I'm, thank you. <laughs> there it is, the six Ps, ready for wildfire.org. Yep. And, um, and there are some new apps that are coming out. Um, I'm actually kind of unofficially being recruited by one of the companies that is making big headway, but I'm, I'm hesitant because I don't know what my responsibility is with the feds and the private sector, but there's more apps that are helping emergency managers get the notifications out a lot faster. And that's why there is a market niche for those type of companies because uh, for anybody who has been in a stressful situation, you want to get the information quickly you want reverse 911 to work. You want your cell phone and everything that you had scheduled to get the notification to actually get it, the Nixle or however your area works. Um, and that's becoming a much bigger deal to folks over the years. So for your preparedness, making sure that you have, you know, how is it that your uh, borough or county notifies you? Uh, up in Alaska, I get these great Nixles all the time when there's something going on. And I know, bing, there it is. Okay, be prepared. Um, down here in Lake City, I'm kind of on my own. I haven't signed up for anything, so I'm a little complacent here. Uh, so after this, I'll actually go online and I'll figure out what my text thing should be. But do you have a, a system? Do you have a way to be notified? When your neighborhood goes under uh, a yellow or a warning, how are you gonna get that information? And then do you have a group, a network in your community that you're gonna share it with? Because that's another big part of this, is getting through the, these extreme fire seasons together and when, when people do that, the resilience and the bonding 
And it, it reminds us of the old days of people having each other's backs and having little call down lists and, hey, did we make sure Susie got the notification? Uh, that type of caring is really important. Questions? We can also go to the um, prepare the volunteer slide too. We can we can plug the local organization um, that, because in the recovery piece you can be involved too, right? There's the you definitely want to be involved in the preparedness. You want to be involved in the firewise, and then Growing Fork Outdoor Volunteers uh, on the left. That's a volunteer reseeding. So there's somebody who took their time to go out and make a difference, and I bet that felt darn good. And of course, anytime you're in the landscape that's burned, you learn things and you observe things. And so there's the contact information. There's other organizations in your area. Um, because our town of Willow has burned down twice, we have a very strong VOAD, Volunteer Organizations Active in Disaster, VOAD. And this last fire, as soon as the houses started burning, the VOAD was ready to work with the incident management team the Red Cross, the recovery, Casey Cook at the borough, the emergency manager. And we were so much more prepared to be resilient, to get things going, to work on insurance and everything else um, because we had been through it once and everybody made sure they were ready for the next one. Okay, great. So there's Renee. Um, we have the in Garfield County, register garco911.com. Hopefully you're already on that. And then, yeah, NC Web is our federal website for uh, updates on fire. And then generally speaking on fires, we we use NC Web, Facebook, and our team especially use YouTube because it's a nice long archive. So all your videos for the Grizzly Creek Fire, every single one of them is on YouTube. And you can go back and you can watch every Operational briefing, every break it down session, every community meeting, it's all right there for you. Oh, wow, look at this, Elizabeth Poulos. Uh, larger impacts in the fire season. Do you have any advice for fire academy hopefuls and soon to be graduates? Okay, great. Yes, um, you know, fire is about on the job training. It's about being out there, so hopefully uh, Elizabeth, can you let me know what, what you're training for? Are you doing the 130, 190 wildland? Or are you doing structure? So it's, you know, the, I showed you that first picture of Aaron Colossi of the fired up and, and we are a fired up group of people. It does help when new blood comes in though. And, um, and, and, and brings, you know, kind of hope and pacing and, and all the rest of it. Okay, great. Oh, Marissa's doing, so we have two folks, 130, 190 this June. So the, the golden standard for becoming an entry-level wildland firefighter is 130, 190. That's the one I took in Salida. And so anybody who wants to become part of a volunteer local fire department, that's a good qualification to have so you can help with a brush fire. Remember, it's always the locals like Mina and, and the chief and everybody in Glenwood and Eagle who are responding right away. They have brush trucks, they have wildland training. Yep, there we go, look at that. So, um, you know, we, I think sometimes the incident management team come in and everybody thinks, oh, it's this big incident management team that's getting all the work done. It's partnerships, it's interagency, it's everybody working all together. Oh, okay, great, yeah, to, to get it all done. So if you wanna be involved in being proactive in your community, look at, getting um, with, your, with the local fire chief and trying to sign up as a volunteer, getting out and helping with recovery. You know, ideally, if, if I were in a small town um, here, like actually in the town instead of above the town, <clears throat> I'd be looking to see if I could recruit, you know, some folks to, to help maybe the elders with FireWise. And, and that's certainly something when I get back to Alaska, I've got a couple of neighbors that uh, I owe some work to that I'm gonna go over and drop some trees that will make them feel safer for the summer season. So that kind of that Boy Scout, uh, neighbors helping neighbors, uh, being proactive, anticipating your neighbor's needs. Not everybody in the community uh, has the ability to take care of their property because of age or finances or what have you. Okay, great. And there's Tracy's put in Eagle County. 
um, uh, ecalert.org, which is great. Okay, Amory, any other questions? Asking anything, folks. Do we get scared out there? Yeah. It can get scary. Is there a lot of personal growth and some really amazing moments? You bet. But coming back to town and seeing posters and seeing people happy and seeing people not armchair quarterback us and not tear us apart at community meetings is probably the best because you just want to be able to do your job and the job's getting harder and harder. Great, I see Elizabeth uh, said I facilitate the offerings at CMC's Fire Academy, which I know I have a, a kiddo that wants to get in that and it's already full, so that's good news. Oh, wow, okay, they filled up for this year. Or then, maybe she can put some light into that, Elizabeth. Maybe there is some room, but I know that he was trying to get into some of the classes, so. And then other folks, uh, if you have questions, leave them here. I can always circle back around. I see all sorts of great names out there. I'm wondering what's on your mind. Okay, there we go, Greg. Do any homeowner insurance companies cover mitigation or, okay, so this is becoming a bigger deal. Um, <clears throat> remember I told you about that town burning down, um, Ruth, California last summer, Ruth Valley? When we, when the dust settled and the bickering started and all the finger pointing, uh, these private engines rolled in as well. And the private engines were, were parking in front of um, houses that had uh, that type of insurance. And so there's a, there's a way now you can basically pay to have a engine boss with an engine and a crew member assigned to your house. And I've seen that more and more, but certainly uh, this summer in California, when I was uh, filming all the hose lays going down the road of houses that survived to show the evacuees, hey, we've got structure protection in place, the hose lays are in, the crews are here. I was asking some of the engine crews if I could film them, of course. I always get their permission first. And the, this one guy says, oh, yeah, I used to be a wildland guy, now I'm a private guy. So he just goes from uh, house to house for the insurance company, parking that engine right there. And that's their job. And so, but that didn't answer your question, Greg. You're gonna to have to inquire about the mitigation. There, there could be ways in which with the new, what, you know, new evolution of insurance that, that you work with your insurance agent and say, hey, look, what if we, what if we invest this much um, you know, into uh, defensible space and blah, 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 and, just, and start having those, <clears throat> those discussions. All right, so Marissa says, okay, she already had two fires in Summit County. What are some of the general takeaways I can talk to people so they don't make stupid mistakes to start wildfires? Okay, so the number one answer to the question, how many ways are there for humans to start fires? The answer is millions. Every person can come up with their own mistake, their own, oh, I didn't realize, or uh, if you'll recall back to 20, 2001 and 2002 for the Hayman, we had that drought. That was the drought in 2001 that actually damaged the Aspen forest in Colorado with the blight. Uh, it it uh, stressed them so much that years later we had that kind of awful blight across the uh, Aspen groves. And I live in one of the bigger ones around here and I've cut a thousand trees. Um, that uh, you can easily drag a chain during the dry year. You can light a firework. You can have a campfire in your backyard. You can go out camping like everybody did during COVID and leave fires unattended. It's that same prevention nightmare. How do you deal with, with the human factor? Good luck. That's, that's a lot of people's jobs right now is reminding folks, please don't light off fireworks, please obey rules. So good luck with that. Okay, Casey just left, thanks. Casey for being there. Okay, Jessica with the Post Independent uh, from Chicagoland where I grew up. What advice do you have for someone who will be in the first fire season this summer? All right, Jessica, welcome to, welcome to the West. Um, you've learned a lot tonight. You know, um, I don't know if you own or if you rent, 
but you know, take a fresh look at your house tomorrow or your apartment, wherever you are. And if you have no concerns, okay, great. Now go down to your next checklist. What's your evacuation plan? Who's the, who are the people in your community that you're meeting now that you can talk to about, hey, if we have a fire, what should we do? Whose house should we go to? How should we get through this together? Ideally, you're all vaccinated. Maybe another reason to do that so that you can actually shelter in place with somebody who's out of the evacuation zone um, or, or go to a shelter. Uh, Laura asked, what can a community do at fireworks sales in July? Oh my gosh, Laura, um, is there a way to fight this that you know of? That's, it's so brutal because just like in Glenwood Springs, uh, the biggest firework dealer in Alaska lives 20 minutes from my house. Uh, and of course, I've already told you I live in the black. And we have a rule that from April 1st through the summer, you're not allowed to light any fireworks off. And yet here's like this mega stand, right? The kind that you know, gets traffic from Anchorage and the Kenai come up to shop at this one stand. So we're in the same position. Okay, they're not allowed to light uh, the fireworks in the summer, then why are people buying tens of thousands of dollars a day? It is one of those just sort of capitalistic nightmares. Um, so hopefully the community of listeners here can help you with some ideas for how to deal with that. Okay, yeah, and then there's a funding source question. There can be, yep, um, there can be uh, times when your area and the people in your area who do this job have gotten some firewise mitigation funds. Um, I know over the years they were paying people uh, to do work on their property when that funding comes in. So check on that. And then that's another community goal to work towards. <clears throat> and ET recommends if you Google firewise grants, you should be able to find some ideas there. Excellent. I know Mina uh, from the fire department, Mina Bolton, she had mentioned the firework issue. I said, Mina, what, 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 what prevention message should I, should I stress at the, you know, during the talk? She's like, fireworks. I'm like, those damn fireworks. Because <laughs> it really is the same situation where I live. So, Kale, I'm okay. just curious too, um, what would be some of the, the most common? I mean, it, I always think of cigarettes, cigarette butts, but I don't know if that's true. So lightning, I mean, I don't know, what are some of the more common ways it started? I mean, I know there's Certainly. a million. Yep, you know, obviously natural ignitions, um, you know, lightning and what have you, power lines are big, um, dragging chains. You, you know, when they were investigating the Grizzly, it's like, God, there's a million cars a day that drive down the I-70. You know, what, what could have caused that? A million things. But on the human front, no question about it. Just people being lazy and, and, and not thinking straight. Uh, not putting out fires, not <clears throat> taking that uh, that aspect of summertime enjoyment and, and family fun seriously. Um, the fire that got us in 2015 was was that it was a uh, they were in their yard. They had the campfire. They lit some fireworks off, and it was either the campfire in their yard or the fireworks that got us all. Um, <clears throat> and I know I have other PIOs on here that could probably throw some some things in the chat, but you know the most. Typical human cause fire is preventable, and that's people messing up with their campfires and or at home uh, with fireworks. Or, and then there's the element about when you when you are if, if if you've ever been in a situation where you've lit something up that's starting to move. Remember, fire spreads exponentially. So, as soon as you lose a little bit of it, you're probably going to lose all of it, uh, depending on the fuels around you, because it just moves exponentially. So. There is that other human factor of like maybe trying to take care of it themselves too long because they're embarrassed and not calling the fire department right away or not doing something that they should do or not getting additional resources. And, you know, we're, we're all stubborn and we all have pride. But when when the fuels are dry and when we're in the red flag warnings and when we're in high fire danger, it the exponential spread is alarming. And it's overwhelming. And that's why you need hundreds of firefighters, not just a couple, because they've got to deal with that spread and start chasing it and going on flanks, flanking missions and all sorts of things. So, uh, yeah, hunting, hunter warming fires is one of those big ones. Tracy just said unattended campfires are burning during fire restriction. So you will hear the people who work in forests, uh, I think during COVID, probably report a num uh, record number of campers who just drove away and left the fire just packed up went home 
a lot of people didn't know how to camp. Uh, we saw that in Alaska. People just pulled over and pull outs on the Denali Highway and set up a camp, or they were camping in trails. They'd hike down a trail, build a fire pit, and camp. And then our neighbors who run sled dogs up there, like, we were four wheeling with our dogs training, and then people are camping in our trails. Like, like these are trails, people. So imagine those folks also will walk away from the fire. Okay, great. Thanks, Ludi, for that. Looks like Colorado State Forest Service offers some homeowner mitigation assistance. So that's in their um, post the link above. Laura, you you helped put this all together. Do you have any questions? Uh oh, she might be muted. Should be locked. So you actually just answered it. My question was about the fireworks, which drives me insane. That we have a big, big fireworks stand just outside of town, and it's just dry, dry, dry. And there's a firework ban. You know, you can't light them off, and yet there, there they are selling them. And um, it's it's just so difficult to drive by and and see. And I was just wondering if there was anything that we can do to prevent that. Um, maybe I just need to talk to my city council people or. Um, yep. Anyway, but that was my question. So thanks for answering that. No, it's, yeah, you bet. It's tricky too because capitalism does have this weird, strange way of reigning, right? You can't. Uh, maybe everybody's going to drive them to a different state, and then, and then that's their justification. That's what they say in Alaska too. We're like, no, they're going to go home. Now, granted, we have 20 hour days, so it does help us because people don't light as much because uh, you can't see them when it's midnight sun. Um, but they're still out there and you can hear them popping all over the place. Yeah. Okay. So Adrian said, unfortunately, that guy is on unincorporated county land. And that's usually what the, what the deal is. They pick that perfect little capitalistic island where, you know, Americans rule and you can't tell me what to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to bash on anybody, but it, you know, um, well, everybody feels it. I mean, look at how long it takes to get these things under control. I mean, just the sheer exhaustion of resources just to get these things under control. It, it's, I think if I were you in the public and, and I hadn't done 15 years of this, I'd be asking like, why does it take so long to contain these things? Like, it, it, cause everybody's busting hump. Why does it take so long? And that's just that, incredible resistance. I mean, how this stuff lives in duff and, and, and roots and stumps and weights and hides. And, you know, even after we had the Labor Day snow for Grizzly, we had to worry about warming up in September and October and potentially having a rekindle there, right? We weren't out of the woods yet just because we had a few inches in Labor Day. And as Coloradans, we all know that because we remember back in the day, 21, when the ski areas didn't have any snow until November 26th. And then we got like three feet. Well, that was a scary fall, right? That was, we had a tough year. So I guess I'm just, I'm hoping that after our experience last summer, that, that maybe people will have a, a different view on fireworks. I, I realized that it wasn't fireworks that started this particular fire, but um, certainly they are a contributing factor to a lot of fires. So maybe, maybe there will yes. be a, a new, a new thought on that. And Glenwood dodged the bullet. Right, really, essentially, um, the billions of dollars for the infrastructure there dodged the bullet, and there's a lot of fuel left. I always think that when I'm driving around, it's like, how many more fires could we have in this forest? Oh, a lot. There's a lot of fuel left, and we did get some snow, so we're going to have some grasses. We're going to have the flashy fuels, but we're also pretty decadent, uh, and we're windy. Um, so let's let's make sure that in the community conversation that we're that the awareness is staying where it needs to be, because we're already right there. April 15th, we're there. Anything can happen at any time, especially in those drier areas like Meeker and the, those interfaces. Okay, so the CSU grant deadline is May 19th. So you have 34 days. Everybody here on this call has 34 days, May 19th, to put in for some funding assistance. And Mina said, save fireworks for New Year's Eve. You betcha. Well, I think this is definitely one of those great, I mean, education, 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 and Kale, I cannot thank you so much. I mean, this, 
This has been so great. And Nina, thank you so much for introducing us. I mean, I'm not trying to cut it off, but I just want to make sure I tell you thank you and all the all the fire people that are on board. I mean, this is so helpful. This is one of the best ways. Um, you know, the post independent, if they continue to get the word out, and then the the um there's gonna be a the Eagle County television um Cheryl Bottomley, she is on there. So if we could just keep getting the word out and keep having conversations like this, it's definitely one of those that's going to help. So we thank you so much. And yeah, if anybody has any other questions, please keep them coming. You bet. It's an honor honor to be with you all. I, I never, I'm kind of like that person who never feels like, I, like I've done enough. Um, so if there's other ways I can get you information or if there's conversations you want to have, I put my email way up at the top there. Um, I also have a, uh, a Vimeo channel called PIO365 that has 400 plus videos um, from fire <clears throat> and different techniques, different briefings, different things. Um, so if people are doing classes or showing or want to show extreme fire behavior, um, a lot of the Grizzly Creek uh, good, uh, good ones are on there, but more importantly, like aerial ignition, hella torch, back burning, strategic firing, all the, if you want to like show some folks what the nitty gritty and the hardcore looks like when we're actually in the theater trying to put these things out, it, you know, it's colossal. It's colossal what has to happen. And, and we thankfully have a lot of footage these days to show, you know, how big these problems get. Your okay, right on. Thanks, Amory. Put that in there. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Nancy. And so this this photo right here, Governor Dunleavy from Alaska stole it for his social media account. But I took that of our native Alaska crew. We're in Eagle. We're looking towards you west. And we're at our incident management uh, command post there. And that old gentleman in the green shirt, he had these beautiful native Alaskans folding, learning how to fold the flag every night. And that will be one of my long-term memories of the community uh, and of course that killer rainbow that we had the double rainbow on you know the hope day because hope is a big part of this too right your your landscape actually renews with proper fire the sheep the ungulates everything does better when we have proper fire or what we call good fire um, and so that's the other part of this is once we get through the trauma and the landscape gets to bounce back we actually realize Okay, we all got this through. The, uh, we all got through this together, and now we actually have a more resilient landscape, ideally. And that brings us right to eighteen hundred. Oh, sorry, that's Alaska time, twenty hundred. <laughs> I have my laptop set to Alaska because I'm, I'm doing my online job for up there. Okay. So thank you all. I'll stay on for some minutes for some folks who might have waited to ask something or. What have you? And I just thank everybody for being here. I'm, it's an honor to see so many people's names and organizations. Eagle River Fire. Oh, there, there were people from all over. It was so cool. What a great group of people. I mean, we had one. Uh, was I saying it earlier? Kansas City. We had Orange County. Yeah, it was just very cool. And normal, yeah, so it. it, it it is amazing. Normally, uh, Amory, in my when I'm live streaming, like I did rod and stuff, I'll start calling on people and being like, "Hey, David Sneerly, where are you from? Call him Widlock." But I'm not sure if people want me to do that. But if they stay on, and I don't know if they're allowed to unmute themselves, but uh, it, that's part of the fun engagement, you know. But I know, yeah, I know definitely. You, all, you all have lives and you have um, other things to do tonight. This is my life. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's right. We could let's see. Um, yeah, let's unmute people. Yeah, if anyone wants to jump in with a Greg Young or Karen, uh, Nancy Genova, Renell Lott, Ruth Fletcher, Tracy LeClaire, Trent Jones. Oh, now, so yeah, anybody can unmute yourself if you, hopefully that worked. If you want. Michael Ofut had some good questions in there. Thanks again to Ludi and to Elizabeth and Mina, my PIO crew for having my back. We should definitely try to connect you with our CMC contact that does the fire um, classes and stuff like that. Sure. That would be really cool. That would be cool. Is Lorraine Miller? I, we have a camera. We have a question. No, hey, Lorraine. 
<laughs> I just want to say thank you. This was super interesting. I really appreciate it. And a side note is my dad was a hotshot. And so uh, I remember some of his talking about firefighting in the early days. So great. Yeah. Well, thanks to your dad. We have this great long tradition of people stepping up and putting themselves through hell and yeah. being tougher for it usually. But um, that's great. Yeah. The shots have come a thank long you. way. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to yeah. out, but I Excellent. appreciate you. Have a great night. Thank you, Lorraine. Sheen and Nigger. Thank you, Lorraine. Yeah, I think Christmas one. Thanks again for coming out here and everybody involved in this. Um, my the place I'm renting back sell to BLM land, and yep. I'm in like a pinyon pine oak. Yep. Out like service very very dense, um, and I don't have a lot of spacing between them. It's kind of really steep. I don't know what you would recommend other than taking the trees. I think in the thing it said six feet up. Um, yeah, that limbing is huge. Yeah. Right? Because you're trying mm -hmm. to prevent the ground spread to go up and become a crown. Yeah. Right? That's the difference. Once those ladder fuels are gone, then it's harder for it to ladder. Okay. And then the other thing is um, my the um, myself and the landlord, we don't really care about the house. And so is there a sign we can put up front when we if we ever have to evacuate that says, like, go to my neighbor's place? Like, Absolutely. We're good here or something like that? Absolutely. In fact, in Northern California, where we had the big dope grow that we were protecting on that million acre fire, the dope growers would not leave at all. They had million dollar crops everywhere, but they started making huge signs to tell us what they did have. Hey, I've got a $1,500 water tank. I have two pumps or I have That's this cool. because they, we, the fight of getting them to leave was over. We knew they weren't going to leave. They had too much at stake, but then it became a cooperation game where they said, we'll just let the firefighters know what we have. Cool. Well, I'll let you know where my 55 gallon water is <laughs> then. So you guys know where that's at the back. But thank you again right for on, everything. Good, good yeah. question. And, and way to think about your neighbor's place before yourselves if, if theirs is worth more. Yeah. It's all, this place is made with all like reused materials and it's all wood. So it's going to go <laughs> eventually, no matter what, you know. So, yeah. Yep. yeah. So thanks right again. On, you bet. Okay, Emery and Laura, back to you guys. I don't want to keep it past your um, uh, your, your cutoff there. Well, I'm actually gonna go feed Problem. my fire. I've got a little burn pile going outside, and I'm gonna throw some more limbs in it because I am obsessed. <laughs> well, this has been so good. Thank you. I don't know if Mina is still on. Is she still on? Let's see. I, I think. Uh, yeah, Mina is there. Oh, she is. Mina, I'm. Is there. What are you doing? It's fun to see the squares kind of, yeah. Down, you know, there's so many cool people. There she is. There you go, Mina. Is Mina muted? She is. Thank you so much, you guys. There you go. We can barely hear you, Mina. Break into song. I'm going to stop recording too. <laughs>